What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest with Mr. Jack Maulers, Rockstar Dev, and uh, Mr. Bob making his first appearance on a podcast from Strike Gro- or Wow, I was about to say Strike Global. <laughs> Strike Global. <laughs> so uh, what's going on today, guys? Yo, thanks for having us. I think this is the first time uh, we've ever done a team podcast, so... I'm pumped. I'm pumped to hear what uh, Rockstar and Bob have to say. But thanks for having us, buddy. Mm-hmm. No, I'm pumped too. I mean, uh, when I was joining Strike, like, this is one of the things that I was thinking about that will happen eventually. It's happening now. So it's a pleasure not only to be with Jack, but our man Bob from, as you said, Global <laughs> Strike, Strike global, global. But yeah, Bob is so much when it comes to business development. Thanks for having me. It's my my first podcast, actually, so uh, it's glad to be on. Mm-hmm. So you know, I think uh, la- last time you were on, Jack, we kind of just dove through um, Lightning Strike and the uh, the fiat interface to Bitcoin that it created, and uh, <laughs> you you've now taken that global. So I guess uh, you know, I guess you a rock star kind of want to give a high level overview of a. Uh, what exactly was done here to expand Strike beyond the U.S.? Yeah, I'll go over conceptually from high level and how we're thinking about it uh, as a business, more or less, and just what we're trying to achieve generally for the human race. And then I think Rockstar's thoughts uh, as like leading a lot of our engineering effort um, and how this has come together would be super cool. Um, but generally, I said in my blog posts and on podcasts, uh, you know, Lightning gives this new bear instrument Bitcoin that has global access on its own monetary network, cash finality. And the combination of that means that we can escrow physical value, no credit needed to any counterparty anywhere in the world, anytime, uh, instantly, and for essentially no cost and sometimes absolutely free. And if there is a cost, it's extraordinarily trivial, especially given content who it's competing with. So when you have a monetary network like that, for me, it was always painfully obvious. One of the first applications was going to be going after borderless payments, making payments borderless, instant, any time of the day, anywhere in the world, and for free. Uh, And so that was always my mission personally. Uh, Strike here, you got to start somewhere. You got to get a license, many of them actually. Uh, and embark on building this infrastructure from the ground up and making it interoperable with people's bank accounts and debit cards. And then the second latter half step of that is going out and achieving partnerships all over the world uh, and building the necessary infrastructure to essentially become you know, like a Forex desk on steroids. And so I'll stop there and I'm sure we'll get into which partnerships and which counterparties are involved and all of that stuff. But I, I think the mission is as clear as day, and it's been received pretty well. Um, admitted to there, there's always some people on Twitter. But outside of that, I think it makes all the uh, sense in the world. And it's not even my idea. Like recently on Twitter, I quoted Satoshi, um, and then there's all sorts of threads on Bitcoin Talk, and then Twitter, and then now here we are with Strike. But I think for this asset class in Bitcoin, it's been probably like a day in the making so i'm just generally fucking fired up that uh i'm part of this i feel lucky and uh excited for the future really rockstar what's going on with the nuts and bolts under the hood oh man tons of nuts and bolts under the hood um just start thinking about when jack is saying we're lucky to be working on this one i always think how it's lucky that um, you know we were able to build this team. And to me, thinking back on when Jack invited me to join all of this, it's, it's his vision realized. 
uh, because when he says like, yeah, it's obvious, it's not so obvious yet to a lot of people, which you can see yeah, from Twitter, Twitter feed. But to me, just that idea that uh, you can, as Jack is saying, like settle money, uh, settle value across the borders is fantastic. And, you know, making making use of Lightning Network for that and, you know, seeing that it will happen within the next year or two. Uh, it's just crazy. I, I, I think Jack Shurud with his, uh, uh, when he talks about Satoshis being these little soldiers of liquidity moving between the regions and the countries and facilitating financial transactions, I, I think the metaphor he used there is like the best to explain what we're doing. Obviously, uh, from the technical side, there are a lot of algorithms in the back end to facilitate that, but Jack, when you get the chance, please proceed with that metaphor because it's such a great metaphor for what we're doing. Yeah, well, I, it was a joke that I made to the team, um, and now I use it in public discourse when trying to explain what we're doing, is that we now have Digital Bear Instrument in the form of these little soldiers known as Satoshis, and they're these little pieces of physical value that are natively digital, inherently global, and operate seamlessly on this new monetary network. And so when I want to send 1,000 US dollars to France, let's say, or anywhere really, Strike is going to debit my 1,000 US dollars, do all the work and compliance and fraud prevention and stuff in getting that money and converting it into these little soldiers. I'm taking the $1,000 and I'm hiring the equivalents in, in little soldiers to run to France. And I say, hey, soldiers, we have some value to escrow. Do you hear me? It has to get to France. It has to get there now. And so say, Jack, I hear you loud and clear. We're off. Say less. And they run across the ocean and they get into France and they say, hello, France. We are Jack soldiers, Satoshis, X amount of Satoshis. We need to find liquidity in the euro for Namson. Jack wanted to escrow physical value to Namson. And here we are. Please give us euros so that we can give it to Namson. And so they run across the ocean. They get there in less than a second and at no cost. And then they find the euros because, of course, Bitcoin has 24-7, 365 liquidity in any given currency you could ever want to use. And then Namson gets the euros. And these, then the little Namson may want to send the little soldiers to Germany. And then Germans may want to send them to Australia. Australia may want to send them to El Salvador. El Salvador may want to send them back to the U.S. And these little soldiers scale infinitely well. Um, and there's no credit involved. Like they carry real value and can be exchanged in another country, across another border, across another ocean instantly and in real time and carry the necessary collateral and achieve real-time settlement and clearance with anyone at any time. And they're on an open monetary network. So in order to work with these little soldiers, all you have to do is spin up a fucking lightning node. <laughs> it's not like you got to go to boot camp, apply to be part of the army, to like work with these soldiers, speak their language. It's like, no, like you just download free and open source software and like you can hire the soldiers. And like you could use our soldiers. I mean, so I don't know if I'm making any sense there, but like, it's a funny way that we frame it internally as a team is like, oh, you need to get value over there, whether it's for a hoodie, whether it's for payroll, whether it's for sending money to family. Yeah. Hire the little soldiers. How many soldiers do you need? thousand dollars worth, $10,000 worth, $1 worth, hire the soldiers, ship them over and they'll get it done free and instantly. Boom. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, um, you know, before I lob a, an infrastructure question at Rockstar, like I, I feel like this is something that a lot of people have been missing um, looking at Twitter. And it's just the, the liquidity dynamics. Like if you wanted to try this cross um, currency kind of settlement system without lightning, I mean, you're going to need reserves in all of the currencies that you're dealing with to try to swap between them. You're going to have to deal with the delays of the Forex market, the spread on the Forex market and all the extra fees, like the 
the time, the costs, the the liquidity requirements are so much more massive than just well Bitcoin trades against all those things. So all I really need is Bitcoin and I can turn that into whatever fiat reserves you need in a, a different jurisdiction like that. So aside from the cost savings, like your capital requirements are just Bitcoin. Correct. There's a lot to address on Twitter. To be honest with you, like I was talking to Bob and my parents and everyone was like, don't entertain it. Like it's just not worth the time. So I don't know how much deep in the weeds we want to entertain a lot of that stuff. But generally speaking, this should clear up a lot of Twitter. Um, the the parties that are transacting from the U.S. and to the U.K. or the U.S. into Europe right now in our testing are separate parties. To be clear, let me make this very clear. People can link this audio to anyone on Twitter. We have zero relationship with Bittrex, the U.S. Entity. Our relationship is with Bittrex Global. They are separate entities. You can go into our terms of service today, right now, and Command F search for Bittrex. We have zero relationship with Bittrex, and we have a functional United States product that does millions and millions of dollars of volume a month without Bittrex. So, how do those millions and millions of dollars? How are they being tested and getting shipped to Europe? There is no balance sheet that I can just update in Excel. That's not a thing. Like our relationship, we're enabling the banking partners that we have in the US, these exchanges and partners that we have in Europe, we're, we're all enabling them in requiring them to be interoperable on this new monetary network and putting in the ties and systems to make it usable and exposed to the consumer in a convenient, functional way. Like, so first of all, the fuck are you talking about? That there's an Excel sheet that I have control over. I don't have control mm -hmm. over any fucking Excel sheet. Okay, here's another one. I just landed a banking partner in Mexico today. How do you think I'm getting fucking pesos to anyone instantly and for free in Mexico, which is like the third biggest inbound remittance place in the world for the United States? Does Bittrex Global support pesos? Oh, by the way, Bittrex Global doesn't support anything besides use. So how the fuck do you think I'm doing pounds? How the fuck do you think I'm doing pesos? What about, please point me to the Excel sheet, you moron. Here, here. here. <laughs> That's what I have to say about Twitter. Oh, also, there's one more. There's one guy that won't leave me alone who thinks I'm like using uh, fiat stable coins and stuff. Like, let me be clear. I, this is really important, actually. I want people to use this uh, audio snippet as well. Um, I so we do use USDT. Let me tell you the purpose, the reasoning, and the story behind this. We use Tether because smaller markets do not have access to the fintech banking infrastructure that JP Morgan Chase provides an American citizen. El Salvador, many other countries that probably give us a target audience of four and a half billion people would not be able to use Strike without some functional collateral. And a stable coin is that collateral. Is the stable coin that we use USDT with in partnership with Bittrex Global on ETH? Yes. Am I ashamed by that? Yeah, kind of. Have I been very vocal to Bittrex Global that they need to implement liquid and other forms of USDT? Because I personally am never going to run a node outside of Bitcoin and Lightning. We use their infrastructure for that. And I've been extraordinarily vocal that, hey, you guys have to adopt to this if we're going to be long-term partners become a priority but at the end of the day i'm not blockstream it's not really my job and i'm looking to save lives in central america but we we're not like interoperable with the ethereum network let's make that clear our use of tether is database updates of p2p payments in el salvador and when they need to get money out make remittance payments over the lightning network back to bitcoin when they need to get money in and receive tethers it remains inbound over the lightning from bitcoin or your chase account or whatever but I'm like for people that think that like there's people accusing me that I'm just like a layer on top of Bittrex and I'm using all of their stable coin shit coins like the euro stable coin shit coin like no I'm not like we need the lightning network to pull off what we're doing and I've been very vocal but let's be clear like I, I I'm trying to get one of the bigger exchanges to get interoperable with lightning and 
push forward what is going to be the future of Forex, of borderless payments, and obliterate SWIFT in, I don't know how much time, but their days are numbered now. And you think I'm also, at the same time, going to get them to implement Liquid? Blockstream, who's had $100 million in funding, hasn't been able to do it? I mean, what am I, Jesus Christ? Let's be honest. Like, I'm doing the best I fucking can. But for the people that think we're just an overlay on top of Bittrex US and Bittrex Global, and there's some conspiracy theory that I'm out here, like, shilling Ethereum, we don't have a relationship with Bittrex US, and the only stablecoin we use is USDT with Bittrex Global so that people in El Salvador can have a great enhancement in the quality of their life. They get a crypto version of the Cash App, and that scales to billions of people. And now, hopefully, Blockstream's pitch is even more, and they can get more aggressive in getting people onto Liquid. And I'm more than advocating that. But, like, fuck, man. It's, like, one step at a time for me. So that's the other Twitter thing, as long as we're on the topic. And outside of that, case closed, we can move on from fucking Twitter. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Solid answers, Jack. All right, Rockstar. Question grenade coming your way. Um, Jack brought up earlier um, kind of the sometimes free in terms of uh, actual routing uh, fees through Lightning. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume, and I want you to tell me if I'm correct, that effectively that free versus very cheap comes down to whether you can actually route a payment from one endpoint to another solely through strikes lightning nodes rather than having to plug into and route over other people's public nodes. Exactly, man. I mean, I don't need to explain the details. You already explained them because when I <laughs> hear Jack, <laughs> when I hear Jack's response, it's exactly what you open with when people are talking, oh, you know, you go from one fiat currency to another it's like man do you know about regulations and forex trading and when the markets are open and this and that it's just so much work to get uh, everybody onto this new infrastructure that we can now build thanks to the bitcoin and thanks to the lightning uh, so yeah it's exactly as you say um, we have a lot of work and to do and we're working on that because as you know like management of uh, channels between l and d nodes managing liquidity managing uh, making sure the channels are balanced that we're implementing it and yeah i oh man i wish it's excel sheet uh it's a database entry but anybody who is you know technically even a, a novice with l and d knows how much work it goes into Establishing channels, maintaining the channels, liquidity, making sure it's not un unbalanced. And that's all the stuff that we are coding and, and are doing. And you can see it through the excitement, not just within our team and the community, but a wider. Uh, you know, like people wouldn't be so excited about our product if, you know, we were just doing database updates. So, yeah. I. I also want to make a quick point um, about this, and I, I think it's just really interesting conceptually that um, we are able to do transfers or even sometimes beat the forex rate, which I mentioned in my blog post. We can get to that later. But you're like, well, how is that free? Is no one on the network charging anything? Like there is a capital tie-up requirement, and so that has cost. But what's really interesting is that Lightning enables the ability – to have trustless, trustless relationships in instant finality. Um, but if there is any form of trust involved, it's like a variable. You can set it to whatever we, you want. So if we have a relationship in Mexico and for them offering free or as cheap as possible, like the margins of, that they're going to make for our direct channels, our liquidity to this Mexican bank, I mean, they're not like going to go public from that revenue, but what they could go public with is the customer acquisition of, hey, we're allowing any Mexican resident to get free and instant remittance from the United States and acquiring that user. That user could be worth $100 to them. And so opening a direct private channel and like tying up capital within it because uh, 
the acquisition and, and the mere value delivered to the consumer. So I think that's interesting too, is that like, yes, it, you don't need to trust at all, but there may be value in trusting a little because there's going to, there's seriously, it's going to, it's a free market. It's going to be immensely competitive where if you're like this trustless node on the network, but you're charging like hundred basis points, sorry, my phone's ringing. Then like someone's going to come in and just give me a phone call and say, Hey Jack, Here's the deal. You can trust me. I'm a good dude. I'm a fan of your work. Uh, let's let's talk to me, brother. Like, what's it going to take to to get free insulin, instant settlement and clearance? Because then we can market that to everyone in Argentina, you know. And so I think that's kind of interesting. Is that people think like we're lying when we say free? With the relationships we have, it is free. Do I think it's free for everything and forever? Probably not. But it's more of like a sliding scale. You could set it to whatever you want um, on Lightning. So. Hmm. Well, sad to see Rockstar go, so I couldn't keep picking his brain on this, but he has coding to do. <laughs> but um, you know, you, you're kind of going in like exactly the direction I wanted to pick on this, Jack, because like the the way I'm looking at the back end infrastructure for Strike and how this is expanding is like the the variability there is phenomenal. Like y- you guys could effectively create your own isolated subnet on the the lightning network if you want and whenever you're routing through that i mean like there actually are no fees because you're just routing payments through your own nodes like you're not going to charge yourself and so like i feel like that potential option there even in an environment with like high on-chain fees and the lightning network itself having fees go up, like you can still have that isolated kind of subnet in the lightning network where it is fearless for your customers as long as you can keep the liquidity rebalanced. But that can also still plug into um, the lightning network proper. So like you, you can simultaneously have this isolated subnet to keep fees low for your customers, but still route outside of your ecosystem, you know, and pay those fees for a customer or even um, route um, payments through your subnet nodes um, from the open network and actually generate revenue from that, from people who aren't even your customers. Like, you know, the, the infrastructure flexibility here is just, it, it's absurd. <laughs> Yeah, that's why we're friends, Shinobi, is you're super smart and uh, appreciate, always appreciate um, all of your thoughts. You're absolutely spot on. I'm actually going to get Bob involved here. Um, and this is just the general idea of being interoperable with an open network. This idea that we can make free and instant remittance payments to and from Mexico with partnered banks and institutions. Um, but then once the money gets there, and merchants in Mexico realize, oh, we should be interoperable with the Lightning Network too. We should spin up strike point of sale services that receive Lightning and made it automatically convert to pesos or convert a percentage to pesos. Because once these users have a mobile app in Mexico that receives pesos instantly and for free, they can go spend it at extremely low cost anywhere and they can pay their friends and the network continues to grow and grow and grow. So I'll pause myself there. I'm going to let Bob touch on because I know this is a huge thesis of his and a large reason of why he joined the business and uh, really like thinks that it can be one of the biggest things ever is because of this idea of an o- open monetary network that we are interoperable with by nature as opposed to these competing closed monetary networks that live in isolation. Yeah, and this, and this actually has happened before. Um, and so uh, prior to, to Strike, I was at a venture capital firm called Green Oaks Capital. Um, and we, we invest everywhere globally um, in, in consumer businesses. And, and so about three or four years ago, we we're spending a bunch of time in India. Um, and India um, actually, uh, to its credit, uh, created an open network called UPI. Uh, and so in India, you had this, this business called Paytm. It's very similar to PayPal here in the US. It's closed network. If you're a user, you can pay other Paytm users. If you're a merchant, you can accept uh, money from, from Paytm users, um, but it's closed. So you have to be on the Paytm network in order to, to, to operate within it. 
Um, and what the Indian government did in, in 2016 and 2017 was they said, we're creating an open standard and we're mandating that any bank or fintech application needs to be interoperable with the UPI network. And so what, what, that, what happened almost immediately is you had businesses like, um, like PhonePay, um, which is now the number one wallet in India. You had businesses like Google. You had businesses like BratPay. Um, all didn't exist in 2016. They're, those three businesses are the three just payments businesses in India today. And, and why is that? It's because they decided to build on this open network and they had the benefit of everyone else building on the open network. So when, pay, when, when phone pay was working on building on the open network and Bharat Pay was working on it, they're working on the same thing. They were both building on this open interoperable standard called UI. Um, and Paytm, because the entire value of the business was the closed network, refused to open up and build within this open network for the first two years. Uh, now, now they're interoperable. And now everyone's interoperable. But what that did was uh, you had dozens and dozens of companies that now were building on this open standard. And the combination of all those businesses were able to build a better payments infrastructure in India. And so really powerful anecdote that when you're building on a open interoperable network, you have the power of you have this enormous network effect of every other company entrepreneur helping you build on that network. And so UPI was an insight into what happened in India and our view, and in my view, when I got really excited reading Jack's blog post, uh, I guess it was almost a year ago, um, was that the Lightning Network is UPI, but for everyone in the world. And, and so that's the insight. Uh, um, that got me, you know, on a plane the day after I read Jack's blog post a year ago, and and got me now to to join Strike a few months ago. Yeah, I mean that is a perfect example. Uh, like I, I forget the percentages, but um, aren't like mobile payment apps up from like a fringe minority to like a dominant payment method in India now over the last four years? Yeah, the, the India has completely changed. Like it's 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 really incredible. It's been built there. You have more people in India are on uh, these apps than are in the entire U.S., right? So like 300, 400, 500 million people that use um, the combination of the top five payments apps in India all built on this open and, and open network. And the other, the other attribute of the, the, the network is the Indian government for a certain period of time uh, mandated it was free. And so you had a lot of unbanked um, individuals that could now participate in the financial ecosystem. Now, BI is controlled by government officials. And, and so now there's like pushback that it was like too open or it was too free. Uh, and the beauty with Lightning is there's no one that, no government official that's gonna decide, oops, this like worked uh, a little too well. We should, uh, we should raise prices or we should, we should, stop, we should prevent um, it from doing so well. So um, yeah, UPI, is a, it's an amazing story that's happened in India over, over the last four years. It has really brought millions and millions of people in, into um, the, the 21st century from, from a financial service perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that, that's kind of like the, <clears throat> the craziest thing to me about all of this is like right now, like strike is able to do that. Like, you know, just, just screw the, the criticism on Twitter, Jack, but like one of the things I brought up when I, when I was getting dragged down into one of those threads of stupid um, was the ability to interoperate like that. Like right now, any strike user can pull out their phone and pay any merchant anywhere in the world using open node as a payment processor. And because they support lightning zap zap completely bridges to closed ecosystems. Yeah, that's so, I mean, an even more powerful one. So that's obviously correct. An even cooler one because of the other counterparty that's involved is how Strike users use Cash App. And so people are now demanding, like their friends in a P2P sense, their friends get onto Strike or find a way to pay them 
onto their strike because dollars on strike are just more powerful dollars. You can spend them, like, as soon as we come out with our Visa card especially, you, you can pay rent with them. You can go to the grocery store that doesn't support Lightning Connect or QR codes with them. But you can also use them to send to your cold storage, to pay an, another Lightning invoice, to send to the other side of the world. Like, they're just more f- functional, powerful dollars. They provide more utility on our infrastructure. Why is that? Because we're interoperable with the Bitcoin and Lightning Network than on these closed monetary networks. And so my favorite is kids are beginning to collect money on a strike and their friends are like, no, I'm on cash app, bro. Sorry. And they're like, okay, well you owe me a hundred dollars. So take a hundred dollars on cash app, buy Bitcoin with it, and then send to my strike page on chain. And I'm going to receive that as dollars on strike. And it cracks me the fuck up. It's like, is cash app the Dorsey call me? And like, we come up with some standard for cash app to talk to strike because cash app and Venmo can't talk. You can't pay any external service with cash app. You use Cash App. Once you're in Cash App, you're trapped in their network. You have to buy stocks. You have to buy Bitcoin like you're stuck there. No, it's because Cash App speaks the Bitcoin-based layer protocol and so does Strike. And so now these users hacking it and becoming interoperable with each other. And that's just like a total accident of Cash App. But that's the benefit of the system is like how many active users does Cash App have? Like 20 million? And like Strike can talk to 20 million people and is like the functionality there to be a killer app. Not yet, but like what is the Lightning Network and the services built on top of it going to look like in a year, in two years, in three years? Do you really want to bet against human engineering on an open monetary network? I mean, I've never seen such a bet like succeed. It, like, it, So yeah, it's, fu- it's honestly remarkable. And so especially after the blog post I had, all of these businesses, merchant services are like, why wouldn't I spin up BTC pay server? Why wouldn't I sign up for open node? Why wouldn't I get up with Stripe's merchant tools? And like in 24 months, who's to say that I walk into Starbucks and I can buy my latte with a command line Tor lightning node running in my basement and I have some GUI that I built myself and I can pay for my latte that way. Visa doesn't know about it, like, but Starbucks is interoperable with this now open standard. Like, who's to say that that's not a world we live in in two years? It's like very realistic. And how hard is it for Starbucks to do that? Spin up a le- spin up free open source software and just make sure it's running. <laughs> and if they want instant conversion, where as soon as we get the pre-image on the receiving end, we have cryptographic proof and finality of the payment that we instantly credit them the dollars and they plug into our programmatic OTC desk. Yeah, I mean, like, that's easy. I can get Starbucks set up in 15 minutes. Like, so mm-hmm. powerful, man. Like, dude, I'm personally, I'm just waiting until you guys launch your card, and I think I'm bailing on Cash App. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, the card, like, the payroll thing. I think it's so the idea that you should have a checking account that's interoperable with this open monetary network. And I made this point on my podcast with Preston is like people have this uh there's this brand association with Bitcoin and using in payments like that you're compromising and making some form of sacrifice. Like, yeah, you can use Bitcoin in payments and it's really cool and lightning's cool, but then you gotta live on gift cards, then the, the hoodies and coffee mugs you have access to are kind of limited and you you know you're like trading a quality of life and there's a certain form of expertise that's at minimum required. And now like that's not true. Like, why can't Strike have every feature Cash App has? Like, why can't we let you direct deposit? Why can't we give you a debit card? Why can't you buy Bitcoin with it? Why can't you buy stocks with it? Like, what? Like, what type of fancy cryptography did that require? I'll tell you the answer right here. Zero. There was not like, what the? So why can't you have a checking account that is Strike that does all of those things for you, gives reward, fun, fancy, colorful shit, and then also does the hard work of remaining you interoperable with this open network that gives you features on steroids like free and instant international transfer or when these other merchants do get on the network, you're going to be able to get a discount when you pay Starbucks because they're saving on interchange. I mean, the incentives are built into the system. It has the same type of network effect uh, and positive feedback loop that Bitcoin the asset.
asset does. So like people, the incentives are all there. It's in everyone's best interest to do so. And the switching cost is like super, super small. And by every single time we give Rockstar and, and these guys days to write code, the switching cost gets smaller and smaller and smaller. What was the switching cost in 2017 to be interoperable with the Lightning Network? Really fucking high. You had to download from the command line. You had to talk to Roast Beef about setting it up. There were bugs. Today, it's downloading Strike from the App Store. How hard is that? Really fucking easy, you know? And it's only going to get easier and better because, I mean, the advantages are there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I kind of want to throw a question at you, Bob, before um, I keep going along with Jack here on the back-end infrastructure side. Like, wh what are your kind of thoughts business-wise as far as growth and competition go? I mean, because, like, Strike right now is just fucking nailing it left and right and building out all the software and tools to really accomplish all of this stuff. But like, wh what are your thoughts when other companies and people start seeing the value of that and try to jump into this space? You know, like how does that competition play out when you're plugging into all this open infrastructure and anybody else can do that too? And it's kind of just a matter of like who can pass the best deal to the customer who who can maintain that momentum you know what i mean yeah the short answer is we'd, we'd love for people to jump in and start building on top of the lightning infrastructure um yeah i think we're, we're we have the team and we're the best at it so um uh, I, I think we'll maintain a, a, a lead over them um but we i mean we're dying for people to to, to be building on top of of lightning like right now we're not going to be we're not going to be trying to acquire merchants in brazil as an example, um, would love an entrepreneur in Brazil to, to start building um, a merchant acquirer in, in Latin America. Um, it's someone we, we would love to partner with. Um, and from from my point of view, the space is is just so, so massive. Like we're talking about changing the entire way payments works globally, like trillions and trillions of dollars. And so uh, there, there's plenty of room for for a lot of winners. I think we saw that in in India at a very very small scale, but in India there are now uh, five multi billion dollar companies that didn't exist three years ago because of of UPI. Um, and so there's just a ton of winners that that will come from from this shift. Um, so the short answer is we we could use the help in, in getting people on the Lightning Network. It makes our, it makes the entire network stronger. Yeah, and, and Shinobi, like it's actually pretty funny. Some transparent insight into my journey with Strike was my assumption was always like, I'm not the only one that's thinking like this. Like once you figure it out, it's like clear as day. Like I dropped every part of my life, like became single immediately. It was like, this is it. Like, and my assumption was everyone else would have that. And to date, I wouldn't say I'd be, I'm disappointed, but just surprised that we're kind of being asked to do everything. And don't get me wrong. Like if you give me enough time and resources, I will. But I'm a little surprised that like there aren't, we had a phone call yesterday with uh, some folks in Nigeria and they're like, hold on a second. You're telling me that if I download Blue Wallet right now in Nigeria, someone from the United States, my family member in the United States can get me sats instantly for free from their US dollar account. And then if we set up lightning infrastructure as merchants, then we can spend that money to like Nigerian merchants and buy our groceries with it and stuff. And then if, as long as there's some ramp in Nigeria, uh, to get us into Naira, or if we can use Strike's USDT integration, we are effectively like banked ourselves with free instant remittance, and we can onboard merchants at our own pace and really like transition the way our financial economy and the way our lives circulate and like with economic tools works. And I was like, yes, finally, like finally, people are going to start doing it because like fuck, I can't fly to every single country and onboard all of you guys. Like, let me just write a blog post and do these podcasts to just like make it very clear what's happening. And then I would love, it. again, it's like a positive feedback loop, loop, same to Bitcoin, the asset. It's like, do you get mad when other people buy Bitcoin because they're taking sats off the market? I guess that's true. But you're also probably more happy that there are more hodlers of last resort, right? Like at this point, I think Strike is here to stay for a long, long time. And we're going to be 
be killer in many verticals. And I would love if like someone in Australia just made a carbon copy of Strike. Like we're interoperable with them. Like there, you know what I mean. So, anyways, yeah, th- <clears throat> this that is awesome fucking news, and like th- that is one of the biggest problems I think that this type of infrastructure and things like Strike are solving, which I I don't think has really clicked in a lot of people's heads. Like that, you know. Well, we'll we'll say idea instead of meme um, of like getting Bitcoin to the third world because the money sucks, all the financial problems, the lack of infrastructure, like bank everybody in the third world. That's been a narrative in this space for so long. But here's the problem. All the fucking Bitcoin is in the developed world. How do you get it there? Like what market dynamics actually allow the third world to attract that Bitcoin and then get something else out of there, you know, in exchange for that value. And these types of payment systems that can facilitate things like remittances, payment processing for any kinds of goods or services, especially digital ones. Here's the road to do that. Because, like, you know, Bitcoin can't do shit to help the third world unless you actually attract inflows of Bitcoin to those places. Dude, I'm loving this podcast. You're so right and ahead of everyone else. Like, the way they were getting Bitcoin into Nigeria, for example, before this was gift cards, right? Telling family members to buy a bunch of gift cards send them the codes and then they would there was liquidity to sell gift cards like for bitcoin somehow right and like so if i was nigerian resident i can sell my gift cards for bitcoin and someone in in like the united states could buy gift cards off of me at some discount if i gave them bitcoin but now like let's say i'm in el salvador and i'm accepting one thousand dollar inbound remittance payment from the united states and i receive that as default into tethers but then I have $1,000 and I can then buy bit more Bitcoin with it or I can just receive the whole thing in Bitcoin. Like you're talking about giving functional collateral to undeveloped countries and markets in the form of these stable coins and in sats. Like that, dude, that's huge. Like think of your cuck bucks, think of your US dollars as a form of collateral like to, to like live and acquire things that you want and one of them being Bitcoin. And like we're able to ship physical value to any small market instantly and at no cost. And like we're having phone calls. All I do all day now is have phone calls with banks, merchants, institutions of like hooking them into this network because it's just a no brainer. And we have the uh, infrastructure to if you want to get liquidity then instantly upon receiving into any other asset like the pound or the naira or whatever we can do that for you but you're so right that like how else would you ever have gotten physical value into a country or or small market like what we're discussing without like also without people just standing in the way and charging 25 percent and having it take weeks it's like we're, we're able to just shoot it over the, the ocean like in real time at no cost and no one can do anything about it. There's a company in Nigeria we talked to and they're like, hey, Jack, I have to be honest. We may choose BitRefill to set up our lightning infrastructure. And I was like, thank God, dude. I haven't slept in like a month. Like that's awesome. You think I'd be mad at that? I don't care. Like someone else is going to do the work to make sure you're interoperable. Then we're just going to zip the – the value over the ocean using these little Satoshi soldiers, like yeah, that's such a good point, Shinobi. It's such, such, such a good point. And like, these are the type of ambitions that people, it gets lost on people in these blog posts and on Twitter. Like the bigger picture is so big. It's like a huge picture. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like that's an issue I've been thinking about since I had this conversation with, um, I forget who years ago, but during the demonetization of cash notes in india <clears throat> like it was a big point of discussion well bitcoin can help there well how and a buddy of mine was just like well just just go fly to india with bitcoin and start selling it for gold well okay 
Um, what are you going to do with that gold? How are you going to get that gold out of India? Like, how are you going to transport that gold into something you can bring back home with you to close the loop of that liquidity exchange and do something with it? Because I'm pretty sure if you try to, you know, just stick it up your butt and go through the airport, you're going to get arrested. Yeah. And there's also like what's amazing is these P2P marketplaces like local Bitcoins or Paxos or whatever. They're also realizing now, like, wait a second, someone has to tie this loop where now we can get physical value in the form of Satoshis to anywhere at any place. And anyone can do it just by linking their bank account. And then there's going to be a marketplace everywhere in the world for merchants, for consumers, for local liquidity, like meet up with me and give me cash for these sats I just got from America. Like, fuck, they huge stuff. Like, and everyone's waking up to it. And I think in 12 months, 24 months, you're going to be shocked at how many, like, like, let me tie an example. How, how interoperable are you with a PayPal wallet? Like, I don't know, hundred million merchants or something. I don't know off the top of my head, but like, how interoperable are you with a Bitcoin wallet or strike that is today? Like probably millions of different things you can do with it. How cool, how valuable? Eh, it's not as cool and valuable. Maybe the merchants aren't as high quality as the PayPal network, but in 24 months with the infrastructure like this, man, watch out, watch out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, th I think let's, let's kind of shift gears here. Like, one of the craziest things about this to me, and you know, um, Chris is kind of here in the chat um, talking about the the giant that you're trying to punch in the eye right now with all of this. But um, you know, if Strike is really successful in following out this roadmap, like you're gonna demolish Swift you're going to demolish the Forex market. Like if, if this really succeeds and becomes the big global infrastructure you're trying to build, like those are the things you're going to fuck with. Like it, it is insane to me that you are beating Forex rates a decent amount of the time doing this exchange through Bitcoin. Like that is really crazy. Is it though? Is it really that crazy? I know what you're saying, but I think anyone familiar with this space is not too shocked by it. I mean, you have a bare instrument that is the only true real free market that's operating at its scale. Um, and so is it that insane that anything I trade in and out of it is really the true rate and friction um, that's required of exchanging physical goods like currency? Because what? who else prices it? Central banking pegs? I mean, with, like, you know, as a human being with a rational brain, what do you think is going to be more accurately priced? <laughs> um, anyways, back, back to your point. Um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of uh, who, I wouldn't say we're threatening, but I, the, the way I would phrase it is like, it's just uh, broad daylight innovation. Like bringing it back to what Bitcoin and Lightning accomplishes as a network, network uh it's in and free or extraordinarily cheap cash finality anywhere in the world at any time and that's just fundamental innovation for humanity for money as a technology for settlement for clearance and when you look at what we use today it's so clearly outdated i mean me getting money somewhere takes a week and cost me 20 percent. why like what year is it 1920 like what are we talking about right now are you kidding so I, I understand. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's people that think like I'm going to go to jail or people are going to come slam us and, and try and like whatever. And that, that could very well happen. I think I've subscribed myself to the position long time ago, like by not using anonymous accounts or pseudonyms as names and stuff that me as an individual, I was more than happy to kind of act as Trojan horse and be I'm not really scared of anything. And if I go to jail and the next guy figures it out, that'll be a net benefit to humanity. And you can't stop an open network to Bob's point. There's no one that can be like, yikes, this is working a little too well. Everyone turn off their lightning nodes. 
how are you going to do that? And so I don't, I, I truly don't think I'll be a sacrificial lamb. Um, and I don't think if they, if people did feel threatened, what's in their best interest is to just spin up lightning nodes, not throw me in prison. Because you can't just throw everyone that runs lightning node in prison. Like what message is that sending? Now Zap also, Zap and Strike, we have multiple, like many entities spread out throughout the globe. So if like we need to, we can just go like switch our headquarters to Ireland for all I care. So I don't really value the existential threats from who's potentially being disrupted too highly. Um, but with that being said, I uh, have a very fundamental understanding of uh, of what we're going up against and who's opposing us. And uh, I, I co-signed those, those risks in the position I'm in a long time ago. Uh, it's too late for me to turn back now. I'm I'm here for the greater good, and I have no no problem, no fear in that. Bob, you have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think to add to Jack's point, um, there there are a ton of people that'll be disrupted. So you know, you mentioned Swift. Um, there, but that's a spectrum. So you know, there are also many dozen other money transmission businesses, international business businesses. And some of them will call it see the see the daylight and realize that they need to be joining this open monetary network first. And so you might have like some of the big guys who, you know, the tech is 40 years old and and they can't possibly figure out how to spin up a lightning node and and, and they're bound to get disrupted. But the benefit that we have is there are a ton of really smart, innovative companies in the tech and payment space globally that we will want to join as soon as possible and we'll want to be a leader. And so we we benefit from them joining the network and them helping us build this globally. Uh, and then at some point, the big guys will wake up and say, oops, like it's it's too late. Now I have not just Strike competing against me, but now I have you know 50 guys who all were uh, smaller than me two years ago competing against me. And now I actually already lost. Um, and so we, we've seen this play out in, in a bunch of other industries that, uh, when I was at Green Oaks, and I think the same thing will, will play out here. So I just had a, uh, well, I just had a whole long string of thoughts from years ago pop back into my head. Um, so I think there are a large um, group of corporations who would probably have the back of people doing things like this. Um, so something uh, probably everybody listening won't remember, but back in like, I think 2013 or somewhere around that era, the CEO of UPS actually made um, a lot of positive comments about Bitcoin and his reason for doing that was the giant fucking headache of being a massive international corporation that has to spread money across their balance sheet, across different entities in all kinds of different currencies, managing, you know, the Forex rates there, the slippage, and just a giant financial nightmare. And he spoke very highly of the idea of just having a single um, globally recognized currency like Bitcoin that big corporations like that could handle their balance sheets on. And just hold a single currency like Bitcoin and have seamless interoperability to settle with all of their international partners and contractors and so on. Immediately, based on like just intuition. Uh, and it's it's normal to think like, oh man, Jack's blog post is just a big middle finger to Swift and PayPal and all of these big massive organizations that are assumed to have, have an immense amount of power. While that's probably true, um, th the space that we're talking about of just like changing the way money moves <laughs> is huge. And there's so many others that are going to use this to their advantage to also compete. Like, you know, when everyone's like, well, when is Cash App going to switch over? It's like, they're the most, they're the least incentivized to do so because they, them and PayPal, at least here in the U.S., have the biggest network effect and their 
value is a proxy to the value of the network that they've built. And so for them to be interoperable and start over and sacrifice market share and also like where are their where's their revenue now going to come from? Like the margins on what we're doing, like we can basically do anything at virtually no cost. So if we were to charge like five basis points, we can get away with that because that's five basis points worth of profit. Our initial cost is almost always zero. So as soon as these companies not only sacrifice market share and wipe the slate clean, give away their network advantage, but then also all of their pricing and revenue models goes bust too because Strike can just charge less for everything like we can afford to do so. And so anyways, I think that you're you're going to start to see like the smaller applications like, for example, Chime. They're not small, but they're not PayPal. Like what's a competitive advantage they can offer? They can be the first one with 15 million users to be interoperable with this open network. Like it's advantageous to everyone to kind of pile in, benefit from the work that Strike's doing, that Lightning Labs is doing, that Blockstream's doing, that the Bitcoin core devs are doing, that we're all doing and co-sign on to this effort. And we're, we're just calling the bluff of all of these people, but it's not just me. It's like a collective. And then eventually, like to Bob's point, you realize you're just lost, like it's over. The game is over, whether you throw me in jail or not. Like cat's out of the bag. Humanity has engineered a way to achieve physical cash finality with no credit or counterparty risk anywhere in the world 24-7, 365. It doesn't matter at this point. I've written blog posts exactly how to do it. <laughs> so, and I, and I think the incentive for the people between us and PayPal is immense. And maybe not today. They're, they're all going to follow me on Twitter. They're all going to email me and want to introduce themselves. But in a year when Strike has a million active users, like at what point does it tip? And I think that's the way it goes, really, is like all of these bigger corporations that have to protect their monetary network at all costs, just like the Paytm example in India, they just end up getting the equivalent of margin called. Um, and so, yeah, but if you're, if you're Jack Dorsey, like, do you just like enable what strikes enabled and absolutely sacrifice all market share, all square merchants are now interop interoperable with the lightning network and everyone that goes to uh, a square point of sale can pay with strike cash app, blue wallet, their lightning node sitting in their basement running over tour. And now no one necessarily has to have a visa card anymore. Everyone can operate their life as private, as segregated on their own terms at their own time. Is that really what you're advocating Jack Dorsey to do today? Of course, he's not going to do that. But someone else will. And at what point will he? He's like, so anyway, rant over. But I think it's a much more peaceful based on incentives type of revolution. And if someone lashes out and tries to throw someone in prison, I mean, I think that that stands on obviously no moral ground, but just logically like doesn't really make any sense. Well, I just can't see. I mean, I can absolutely see the desire to go after you so to say but if you're complying with regulations like what really is there to do except try and change those and then go you have to shut down now yeah but th also here's the another like absolutely brilliant thing about strike is when you break down money going from chicago to london all it is is a btc usd buy where I take my dollars that are converted to Satoshis and then the Satoshis fly over the ocean and then it's a BTC EUR sell or in London GBP sell. And so all that actually happened was a Bitcoin buy with dollars, a lightning payment, and then a Bitcoin sell into pounds. And so the regulatory implications there are so profound. If you're going to ban that, then the entire industry is getting banned. And the last thing anyone's worried about is strike. They're just attacking Bitcoin and people's right to exchange for it and hold it and transfer it. And so like we've, we've nested ourselves in this regulatory arbitrage where we don't need to comply with Forex rules. I'm not exchanging dollars for pounds. I'm exchanging dollars for Bitcoins and then Bitcoins for pounds. And if you want to regulate me and close me down and base has to shut down, then the, C the CME and their Bitcoin futures have to shut down. Like then you're shutting down what is now like a multi-trillion dollar industry if you take in the assets market cap alongside all of the companies built on top of it. And so it's like, 
I, I just don't see the angle there. We're doing what everyone else is doing. I just was clever enough to build it in a way that threatens your, you know, what you've been doing the last few hundred years. But all I did was like tweak a little, some variables, turn some knobs. But at, at the heart of it, I'm buying and selling Bitcoin and sending payments. That scales to every single Bitcoin company that's ever existed. So if you're going to regulate me, you got to regulate everybody. And when the regulations that you have created up until this point, we comply and we comply fabulously. So I don't have to t- say, you know. Yeah, and, I mean, like, to your to your earlier point, Shinobi, like the the value that we're driving for our users and eventually corporations, businesses, merchants across the board is so much better than you know the legacy PayPal network, the legacy Visa network, the legacy Swift network. And so it takes a little while for for them to realize that. Like they'll probably have to get a strike account, use it, and then and then say and then realize, wow, I just saved two point nine percent on a interchange fee or a merchant discount rate that I was paying Visa, so they can go pay the banks. And my business only runs at a ten percent margin, so literally just got a thirty percent uplift uh, in my P and L by using Strike. And then all of a sudden they become a proponent, and so now. Um, you have, have corporations, merchants, like the entire ecosystem starts to become a proponent for for Strike and Lightning and Bitcoin, and then it's much harder to to go to that corporation and say um, it's much harder to, to go to you know Walmart and say actually we're not allowing you to use this network anymore, and you have to start paying three percent again. Um, so it's a, a great point on like corporations realizing that this actually is creating a huge value for them as well. Yeah. And I mean, you know, even looking at stuff like the travel rule, like if you have your customers on both ends of something KYC and like, you're even complying with that. (laughs) Like, where is the, the hammer motive there? Exactly. Like when Mnuchin in the treasury came out with these proposed rules, everyone was freaking out. Like, like, damn, are we going to be allowed to do everything we've been working on? It's like, yeah, I, I can comply with that today. I know all the information they want. I'm just getting the value there cheaper, faster, easier, 24 seven, anywhere in the world. But like, like, I mean, we're, we're not like breaking the rules or like we just, and en- humanity's engineered like better open monetary network to accomplish the movement of physical value and clearing it and settling it with counterparties. Like none, none of the rules changed. We just, I mean, it's about damn time. That's all. Mm-hmm. So are you guys ready for a fun rabbit hole of some things that may exist in the future that you can plug into? Potentially, Potentially. although th- this one might be kind of a uh, a regulatory. Eh. Sure. I-, I have to go in 16 minutes, just a heads up. But uh, but yeah, let's do it. It wouldn't be a Block Digest podcast with you if you didn't give me one of these so it only feels right (laughs) so btc pay kind of has on the roadmap um an idea for a kind of like bisc is my take like a peer-to-peer connection layer between different btc pay instances and um the the kind of thought process here is one building federations between BTC pay instances and two um, kind of looking at things like asset swaps um, coordinated through different pay instances. So the minute I heard that um, it's kind of been stewing in the back of my mind. And uh, after you announced the strike global launch, um, I've kind of just been thinking a couple years down the line um, when that's actually fleshed out and built and if this would be kosher from a legal and regulatory sense, um, you know, federated BTC pay groups that are holding stable coins, receiving stable coins for things, um, that's a potential endpoint that could go, yes, we'll take your, um, your Bitcoin over Lightning and we'll give somebody a, a USDT token, send it over. Yeah, I'm not sure there where the hairy regulation. I mean, we like 
It depends. A lot of the proposals and recent talks from the Treasury, from FinCEN, and from really all over the world, uh, we need to see how these are finalized and implemented and certain jurisdictions stance on the future of this industry, what they're going to welcome and what they're going to oppose and ultimately where innovation is going to foster itself. That part's kind of unclear. But yeah, I mean, it, generally speaking, like we've been talking about, we'd be interoperable with any form of service, BTC pay server and people issuing assets on liquid. Is that what you're getting at? And that like people can go from dollars in their chase account to an asset on liquid is in like a second and at no cost or a marginal tiny cost. Yeah, I don't see the problem with that. And if, if regulators are going to try and make that a little, then we're talking about a different story. To be clear, like, you know, I curse a lot and I get loud and stuff, but I mean, we are a regulated entity and we have to comply with the law and we have no intention to do anything. But um, so as new rules get proposed and stuff, we will adhere to them and do our best as a business to continue to deliver value to the world while complying with those given in, in whatever particular jurisdiction we're speaking on. But yeah, I mean, I don't see why in two years, if people are issuing assets on liquid through BTC pay server, why a strike user with cash balance that they direct deposited can't send there. And it sounds good to me. Well, I just see that as kind of opening the door for different things. You know what I mean? Um, like, especially with the the flexibility script wise on liquid, um, sure people are going to scream when they hear me say this. Um, but you could potentially have constructs like, um, I don't even want to say it. Constructs like, die where you have a stable coin that's effectively just collateralized with bitcoin and that be another option for people to kind of hedge stable value on one end of things that you know strike just zips that off to i mean if a strike user is trying to pay somebody with an unhosted wallet and somebody's using an unhosted wallet that kind of swaps that around on the back end so they have something uh, collateralized with Bitcoin, but a, like a stable fiat value. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, expansion potential at the uh, the user end there. Yeah, I agree. I don't really disagree on, on much at all here. Um, if, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you're speculating on what a regulator is going to think and feel about what is assumed to be some pretty serious innovation uh, coming over the next few years and next few centuries, I guess. So, but yeah, I mean, again, like as a business, we are going to remain interoperable with this open network and build the sufficient tooling like direct deposit, count routing number, cards, various partners to provide the services and the easy use and the functionality required to allow it seamlessly. And so, yeah, who knows how a regulator feels in a few years based on what you're describing. Um, but uh, I, 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 I'm not sure really like what much they could do about it, but we'll see. Yeah, the, the good thing is, at least here in the U.S., a lot of the um, self-custodied stuff or unhosted wallets, um, regulators here in the U.S. can't regulate. Um, and so... To the extent there uh, there is actually like a crackdown, other countries is there already is are, are, are stricter laws, um, but the ability for users or merchants to self host uh, their own BTC Pay instance and have the flexibility without needing Strike um, or without needing to go through some sort of KYC or onboarding process to give them the flexibility or give them the capabilities of of something like a Strike. Um, that they could spin up on their own um, are, is huge because then they they can't be subject to government regulation at least here in the U.S. where you have you know First and Fourth Amendment protections. Exactly what I was kind of thinking there, Bob. Is like that, like some kind of collateralized token like that. I can go spin up my non-business like this is being run off the books type thing that's unhosted, and that's kind of like where i'm not sure you know what i mean does doing something like that 
negate the legal definition of an unhosted wallet or is that still an unhosted wallet yeah i think there are ways you can still do it unhosted um and 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 to be clear like you're not under a money service business or a strike or you know whoever comes in and, and builds uh something equivalent um you're you're just accepting lightning payments from a strike um or you know from cash app or coinbase you're not um you know you're not a customer of us but because it's a, the network's interoperable you can interact with us here here so i guess uh yeah you know, i'm kind of uh at the point of being plumbed out of ideas in the head completely blank so uh either of you have any uh parting thoughts or comments um i just want to say i'm like obviously such a huge block digest fan and a fan of yours so always love coming on here but more generally it's such interesting conversation always in twitter dms or whenever we exchange uh and it's i feel like it's fun to see this stuff come to fruition i think we've been discussing it for a super long time so just really glad to catch up with you man i wish uh i got to see you more often uh, and and uh converse more often but it, it's always a good time so just thanks for having me mm -hmm. yeah thanks thanks for having me i think the more we talk about this the more you just start seeing it click in in people's heads so uh, the more of these we can do the better yeah hopefully we did a good job of that today and everybody enjoyed so guess we'll catch you later punks <laughs> Was there was there that sang it just and said, Yeah, you got foot yet. He's hidden it. Yeah, I see 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 it.